So that is a ministry in-house called Divorce Care. The, the divorce rate in America, as you know, is 50%, and Christians aren't doing too good ourselves. But it's a ministry in and of itself because when that happens, healing takes place, right? Healing needs to take place. God heals it. So it's really cool. Jeff and Cindy Lyons have a ministry called Divorce Care. It's so powerful. It's also another opportunity for you to invite someone in the community that may be struggling with that to come and get healing from that. Amen? So invite people. Jeff is actually going to come uh, next week, and he's going to tell you a little bit more about Divorce Care when it starts. It's starting towards the end of this month, and he'll kind of share a little bit more next week. Cool? All right. All right. You're my boy, Blue, in the back. Does the, the hardcore are the BRB, the back row believers. They, ha- they have your back. Listen, <laughs> anybody comes in, they're the first line of defense to stop somebody. So I love you guys. Um, I was telling somebody I have, like, uh, intrusive thought problems. I say what I think. And it happens so fast that I'm like, can't get that back. Get that back. Get it back. Sometimes I'll say something and my wife will look at me, she'll like hit me, and I'm like, what? She's like, why'd you say that? I'm like, you heard that? (laughs) How'd you hear my thoughts? It's crazy. Anybody else have that? Anybody else have that? Come on. (laughs) I know some of you have that. Why? Because the person that heard it texted me. You would not believe what one of those members said. Donnie just had his Dr. Pepper. I don't know if there was something in it, and he said something. So, uh, but yeah, God is good. Self-control. So today I'm finishing up that series called Boundaries. So we talked about boundaries in yourself, boundaries with in your marriage, boundaries. You guys heard a powerful testimony of Ben and Scott from, from bullets to Bibles. And so this is called boundaries, family, friends, and everybody else. Cool? So boundaries, family, friends, everybody else. So excited. And uh, the way our churches were elder um, led. So we have uh, four elders here on the English side, Pastor Jesus on the Spanish side, and so our elders teach. Doc uh, teaches twice a month. I teach half the month, and then uh, a little bit of sprinkle of, of Ransom and Glenn Wooten, too, in between. They bring the word, and it's, uh, it's such a cool setup. I believe it's so healthy. So, But what, what may or not be bad for you is it gives me more time to accumulate more pages. So I'm really excited. This is a three-pager. Buckle up. <laughs> Cancel your lunch plans. No, I'm just playing. I won't, I won't do that. <laughs> um, all right, so boundaries, but I'm going to start with three disclaimers. First thing is, and this doesn't just go for me. This goes for everything. This goes for every video you watch, every YouTube pastor, every message, every sermon, everybody. Test everything and hold fast to what is good. Amen. In fact, I wish the world would test what the media says a whole lot more than they do, okay? Not everything that's on the internet is true. Not everything that is said is true. 26 out of 27 books of the New Testament say beware of false teachers. That happens for a reason. But I've decided it's easier as the pastor to tell you to test every spirit than to try to go around and correct every single person every single time. Because there are times where we might misspeak and it's not out of an ill heart. Does that make sense? My mind is so crazy and moves so fast that I'll be like, what's a good example? Like, I'll be talking to my wife. She'll ask me a question. I'm like, oh, you feel good? What are we doing Thursday? Did you like that salami? I mean, it's just, it's just back to back. So we have the tendency to misspeak. So I always tell people, even in every Bible study here, as people are getting trained up, could you imagine the pressure of trying to be absolutely perfect and not misspeak one thing. Could you imagine the pressure that you have? That's probably why a lot of people don't get into ministry. But it's easier to tell a bunch of people to test every spirit, every sermon, every video, hold fast to what is good, and throw the bones away. You ever went to a restaurant and you're like, those potatoes look horrible, and so I'm not going to eat them. It's the same thing with a sermon. Okay? Anyone understand that? So I always tell everybody, test everything, but it's not just for me. That is for everything you hear on YouTube, everywhere, everywhere. Amen and amen. Second thing is, let's ask the Holy Spirit to lead us and to guide us into all truth. He is the one and only teacher. Amen? So we're going to ask the Holy Spirit to just lead us and to guide us into all truth. I hope you take these scriptures and go home and read them because they're pretty hard to hear. Everyone's a Christian until Jesus says, hey, do this. And he goes, well, I thought I wanted to be a Christian. And then you walk home kind of distraught. So this is a hard message, um, but it's, it's good. 
I'd rather have a friend who would rebuke me openly and lovingly rather than someone who'd flatter me, who does have good intentions for me. Amen? So friends, think about your friends, your, your, your people around you, uh, your environment, everything like that. So we're going to ask the Holy Spirit to lead us and to guide us in all truth. And thirdly, I'll ask you this. Please don't hear something I'm not saying. Pause for effect. Don't hear what I'm not saying. Okay? And I, I made up this saying. Clarify before you let your Karen fly. Oh, come on. Come on. Come on. Clarify before you let your Karen fly. What does that mean? Some Karen somewhere in the United States got a really bad rap because she was just really mean and really just a jerk to everybody. There are wonderful Karens, right? But some have just kind of, just like Judas. I, I imagine after he lived, everyone's like, you a good one? Or which one did I get named after? Um, so it's the same thing. So clarify before you let you clarify means just clarify. And this is a good principle for all of us. Clarify with your friend if you thought you heard something. You're like, wait, do you mean this? Husbands and wives, we learned how to do this instantaneously. It's incredible. But you clarify before yourself, you get all offended and stuff. Amen? Amen. Cool. All right, so let's ask the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I just thank you for your word. It's a lamp unto our feet. Lord, I know I say some really weird stuff sometimes. Um, not out of a bad heart, but I'm human, and I, I just thank you. It's your Holy Spirit, God, that leads us and guides us and teaches us. So, Lord, despite me, I thank you that your word would go and have its perfect work, that your word would correct and convict and renew us in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Cool. So I want to start with this scripture. It comes from the book of Corinthians. Paul was like, you're getting a letter. You're getting a letter. You're getting a letter. Because there was a lot of stuff going on that was pretty bad. And I'd imagine if Paul was writing letters today, we would run out of paper. Amen and amen. So he was writing letters. So in 2 Corinthians, that's kind of where the main text is. There is a lot of scripture. Just let us know on the live or let us know. If you want my notes, I'd be happy to send them. Because I want you to be the Bereans of Acts 17 who tested everything that Paul said to make sure it was in the Word. Um, especially on a day like today, if you say something hard, I'd rather have you go look and be like, man, that wasn't Pastor John's Word. That was God's Word, right? Um, so 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and I'm going to start in uh, verse 14. So, and when you get there, let me hear you say, yeah. People that get there quick, they have the virtual Bible. They're like, hey, Siri, bring up 1 Corinthians. <laughs> cool. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 through 18, which says, and I'm going to be um, stu or teaching really from the English Standard Version today. It says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers, for what partnership does righteousness have with lawlessness? What fellowship does light have with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? That's a demon, y'all. What portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will make my dwelling among them, and I will walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people." Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. So, if you're like me, you read a scripture, and you probably are like, say that again, but like I'm in kindergarten. Can I get an amen with that? Don't act like you don't read the Bible and go, ha, <laughs> What is he talking about? Right? Come on. So I always say, so don't be unequally yoked. So a yoke, as you know, is not the little thing in the egg that is delicious, but it's actually talking about the thing that the cattle and stuff wore, the little wooden things, and it was like, like basically they'd wear it, and, and the, you know, the master would be out there trying to get these people to go in the same direction. So what he's saying is, and I want you to think about the friendships you have, and I would say even the second most important decision that you'll make in your life if you make it, is God, 
through Jesus Christ is the most important decision you'll ever make. Secondly, it is who you will marry if you make that choice to marry. And then thirdly, I would say who you surround yourself with. Okay? So it says unequally yoked. If this cow is trying to go this way and this cow tries to go this way, that's kind of hard to make that work. Do you know what I'm saying? I can't tell you how many people I meet with that are like, listen, I know that he's an unbeliever. I just know that I can flirt to convert. Hey. And I'm like, you, <laughs> I'm like, you are going to go through a lot of troubles um, and struggles because no one can serve two masters. And listen, if you're married to an unbeliever, the Bible even talks about this. Stay married because you will be maybe the example that leads your spouse to Christ. All right? But even my friendships, I have to be not unequally yoked. We're going two different places. Now, here's what I didn't say. When you become a Christian, put the hand up to all your former friends. Everyone tracking. Don't hear what I'm not saying. The friendships that I had before I got saved changed when I gave my life to Jesus. I did not say, I'm better than you. I found a new way. I'm better than you. What I said was, man, I'm tired of living this way, and I feel a pull to live this way, and I love you dearly, but I'm not going to be able to spend as much time with you because I have a flesh. And with what I'm learning, I would rather just go this way. And it's so funny. People think it's so easy. I remember I cried in my bedroom because I'm like, God, this is hard. I have spent my life with these people. These people have had my back. I've partied with these people. I've got emotional with these people. It was hard. It wasn't easy. But I will tell you this. God calls for a separation with his people. He separates the wheat from the chaff. He separates the sheep and the goats. And he'll separate the ones who are heaven bound and hell bound. His grace says everyone will have a chance to be heaven bound. But it's those who purposely and say, no, I'm I'd reject it. We'll spend eternity separated from him. But his grace is that everyone would love him, that everyone would choose him. Amen and amen. But think about the unequally yoked. What is a partnership of righteousness and lawlessness? What fellowship is there light with darkness? Water and oil. I'll tell you a little story of things that don't mix. We had Jared's wedding yesterday. And I have to tell you a funny story just very quickly. Pastor uh, Jesus and Judy made little oils up here, and I have to tell people this. They are not hand sanitizers. I should tell you that before you do it, but I always, I'm like, (laughs) watch, watch, watch. So sorry, Johnny Wells. So it's not hand sanitizer. So anointing oil, and uh, Pastor Jesus and Judy made the anointing oil, and they put it in a container, the leftovers, extra virgin olive oil. So my mom was cleaning up the library and said, oh, there's a good, healthy container of Olive oil. So she put it in the kitchen. So my brother-in-law was making a pasta yesterday, and he's got no, he, I can, I'm pretty sure he wouldn't mind if I share the story. So he, he went, he's like, oh, I need the olive oil. I got to cook the food. So he took the olive oil, or the anointing oil, and he took it to go cook with it. And he's like, man, this smells really good in here. I must be, I mean, this must taste uh, incredible. And then we tasted it. But we, we didn't serve it yet. So we, got, we thank God for H-E-B pre-cooked chicken. Can I get an amen? He mixed uh, the anointing oil in the batch of Alfredo. And so it was blessed. I'll just say that. And we took a bite and stuff. And I only say that because some things just don't mix, right? Some things are just good together. Some things are just not good together. You feel me? So when we ate it, it was funny because Doc had, he's like, hey, Pastor Jesus is coming to bless the food. I said, you don't need to. Lucky you already did. He already blessed it. <laughs> so there are just some things that don't mix. What I'm not saying is that you shouldn't still uh, try to lovingly win your friends to Christ. The Bible says, win the lost, make disciples. But I believe there are priori- prioritizations of our friendships. I believe that when you become a believer in Christ, that God's saying, hey, the valuable relationships that you're pulling from, they need to be the, going the same direction. Does that make sense? Light has nothing to do with darkness. I don't go to my friends who are unsaved and say, hey, I'm really dealing with this sin. What would you say? Puda! I go to people I know that are going to walk the same way in life that I'm walking. That doesn't mean I don't love people. 
I still love all my friends, and in fact, I've been praying for their salvation for 20 years. But I'm saying that there's a specific call of separation that God has, and he says, hey, don't be unequally yoked. Because it's, it's hard. You can't serve two masters. Light has nothing to do with darkness. A lot of you experience this at Thanksgiving dinner with some of your families because they're unbelievers. And you go, pray for me, Pastor John. Thanksgiving is coming up, and there's not a lot of thanks or a lot of giving. It's tough. And I get it. I totally get it. And it's hard because have you, ever, have you ever just got invited to your high school reunion or your old group of friends and you're hanging out and they just feel weird around you? Like, dude, don't cuss. Bob's here. Don't cuss. (laughs) Am I the only one? Come on. You got saved. Like, you love Jesus, and people were like, oh my gosh. They act different. It's why. Light, darkness doesn't like the light. When the light turns on, the darkness flees. Can I get an amen? You now carry the Spirit of God in your heart. You carry the same Spirit that rose Christ from the dead in you. No wonder when you walk into a room. Evil things start to shriek and be like, I can't stand being around. Because if you don't smell, then it is something else. It's probably the Spirit of God, and it is rubbing people the wrong way, like, ah, I just can't. I remember we walked into a store one time, and my wife has the light of Christ inside of her, and this young girl was just like, she did not want to be near her, but it wasn't her. It was Christ inside of her. Light has nothing to do with darkness, and we're going to go through tons of scripture today. Now I want you to look at Luke 14, 26. If anyone comes to me, and this is Jesus talking, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father, mother, wife, children, brothers and sisters, then yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And we talked about this. This is not like, hey, this is talking about the priority of your relationship. Unless you're willing to put Jesus first, he says, then you're not worthy of it. Jesus is the priority relationship that supersedes all relationships. Amen and amen? So anything that tries to take Jesus away as a priority of relationship is probably not a good thing. Listen again in Matthew chapter 10, 34 through 39. Again, Jesus says, do you not think, I, or do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth? I have not come to bring peace but a sword. I have come to set a father or set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Do you understand the gravity of Jesus calling us and saying, Hey, if you're not willing to put me first, then forget about it. Everyone's a Christian until the hard start starts coming. Everyone was a Christian when he said, I'll follow you. Are you willing to give up all your stuff to follow me? Will I become the most important thing or is the stuff the most important thing? Because you have to choose. And what happened? Well, I tried. And what's sick now is people are, are going into a Christianity that says you can put everything first and Jesus. And it's just simply not true. Jesus is the number one priority relationship. Even my closest friendships, I'm going to make sure that they are biblical counsel. I'm not going to advice with something that doesn't mix. It's like putting anointing oil in your pasta. I can say it's my brother-in-law. I love him dearly. He's good. We have to be careful, the one who we choose to be closest to us. And you're going to learn a bunch of Proverbs today that literally speak to friendship and the people that you put in your life. Jesus had the disciple he loved who was that. John, no big deal. No, I'm just playing, I'm just playing. So John, Jesus had John. He said, this is the disciple I love. Then he had Peter, James, and John. He kind of had like the crew. Then he had the 12. Then he had more and more. You know what I'm saying? So there's like this thing that he set up with us. And so don't let me try to talk you out of like your best friends. Let the Holy Spirit and say, am I unequally yoked? Who do you spend most of your time with? Because there's a lot of scriptures, not John sayings, that say things like, Bad company corrupts good morals. My dad said it like this. Hang with the dogs, son. You're going to get the fleas. And I'm sure there's a lot of other country sayings that Donnie knows that are like, if you hang out with these people, you will end up like them. How many have heard your parents go, look at your five five closest friends and you'll see yourself. 
There's influence in relationships. There's influence in the people I choose to be closest to me to be able to speak into my life. I don't go to someone who knows nothing about the life I'm trying to live to seek advice. That brings death. It brings destruction. So like I said, so, so these two scriptures for me set up a principle that Jesus says, hey, Donna, once you have Jesus, there's a separation. I've called you. And now I want you to help me win the loss. I want you to help me that none should perish. I want you to go preach about me and be a light for me that people see that they would want me too. Amen? So there's a separation for even Jesus. Could you imagine being there? And he was like, listen, if you don't hate your mother and your father, I'd be there looking at my mom and my dad like, whoa. The gravity of those words. Whoo! But meaning like I, he wants to be first in your life. It's just like, look at the marriage. Your husband and your wife want to be the closest relationship to you on this earth, right? And, they want, and that's why in the vows we say forsaking all others, because we want to make sure we're the number one relationship. Jesus kind of has the same thing with us. He's like, I don't want you to have any other idols. I don't want you to put anything before me. I want you to love me, and I want you to show it by obeying me, right? So look at this. So wheat from the shaft. Shaft, sheep from the goats, light from the dark, heaven bound from the hell bound. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9 through 13. Here we're going to get into some of the things that even Paul says and gives examples of some of the boundaries that he instilled with people that even called themselves Christian but weren't living Christian. 1 Corinthians 5, 9 through 13, he said, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Not at all, listen to this, this is very important, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy and swindlers, idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother If he is guilty of sexual immorality and greed, is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, swindler, not even to eat with such a one. See, this is one of those things I said, this is a very hard scripture, but don't be like, oh, John said no. This is something God said. A lot of you don't hear what I'm not saying. Because a lot of people would go immediately to you like, oh my gosh, that's so mean. You know what's even more mean? People are going to spend eternity away from God in hell. Now, if that doesn't bring a conviction inside of your heart to start sharing the good news of the gospel, then I don't know what to do. But this isn't talking about the world. Those are the ones we're supposed to preach the gospel to and win over. This is talking about people that would call themselves a brother or a sister in Christ, but they're living in such a way that is an abomination to the Lord. It's people that say, oh, I honor the Lord with my lips. I'm a Christian, but they live in such a way that is an abomination and is just dishonor to the Lord. The church has a problem. It's looking too much like the world because we're afraid to set standards and boundaries of separation. And it's not saying separation in that you're not going to still love and witness to the people that you love. This is talking about in the church. This is Paul writing a letter to the Christians saying, what are you doing? How dare we say we love the Lord and we go on living in sin? You know what this also would probably do? If we're being honest, you know what this would probably do for us? Probably bring an accountability if Donnie was like, sorry, Donnie just is right there, and I look more to my left than I look to, to the right. So you're lucky this week, right side. But if Donnie was like, bro, and the Bible even says the word avoid. Avoid is this. It's when someone comes to our church and they don't like it, and I see them at H-E-B, and I'm trying to be like, look at you. And they're like, oh my gosh, babe, the, pa- oh, the pastor's there. I hope he didn't call that fake number and that fake email. Just leave us alone. So the Bible literally says in this circumstance to avoid. It says to avoid them. So if I'm like trying to eat with Donnie like all the time and he was like, dude, you're calling yourself a Christian but you're doing all this stuff, I'd probably think to myself like, man, what is wrong? Could you imagine if, if Donnie sent me that scripture and I went, holy moly. <laughs> that would cause a conviction. And I really think that the body of Christ needs to live in, a, in that separation. There's a call to holiness. There's a call to pursue righteousness. And here's what I was telling Dr. Lebanon that just ticks me off. How many of you guys are trying to live a Christian lifestyle following Jesus? This is scary. If every hand is not raised, why are we even here? (laughs) 
Let me say it clearer and slower. How many of you in this room are trying to live a Christian life following Jesus? Well, if your hand's not raised, hopefully by the end of the service, you'll respond to the altar call. <laughs> this is what I don't like. This is the tactic of the enemy that you need to recognize so that you can overcome it. This is what happens. You declare publicly, you came out of the Christian closet, so to speak, and it's like, I'm a Christian! Woohoo! Bought by the blood of Jesus, I'm going to live this straight and narrow life. Here's what all your friends do. They put the magnifying glass. And Donna's just, see it's the D words, Donna, Donnie. So Donna's just walking along trying to live her Christian life. She falls on her face. So the, the, the spiritual equivalent of falling on your face is you went out and, and did something crazy. You went out and did something that everyone sees as a sin in the Bible, and they go, <laughs> gotcha, sucker. How many of you have made a mistake after you became a Christian and everybody went, oh, <laughs> loser, loser? Because the enemy has even used people close to you to try to get you to stop running the race. People in your life have been like, I've been waiting. See, God's not real because you're still messing up. I don't know about you, but if I'm assigned a race to run, if I fall, I simply get up and I keep running. I hate that so many people lose their faith because even so-called Christians were waiting for you to sin. They were waiting for you to cuss. They were waiting for you to get drunk. They were waiting for you to make a mistake just so they could be like, ha, 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 I told you. And, and, the, and the, the devastating thing is so many of you bought the lie and you go, guess I can't run the race because I'm not perfect and you're missing the entire point of the entire gospel it's not anything that you can do it's what he did and when I understand what he did it then affects what I do some of you in here have made mistakes this past week and people have been looking they have been diving through Facebook and even MySpace, looking for mistakes in your life I get emails all the time, dude. I got people that, that looked up videos, and I was like, bro, even, like, once you become a new creation in Christ, it's like kind of not lying, but you're like, that wasn't me. That was old me. <laughs> this is why we all need new names, like Saul and Paul. and <laughs> Because, like, I don't know him, bro. That was Jayon. I don't know. Maybe mine was Juan. I was like, Juan, now I'm John. I don't know. I'm going to stop before I make a joke that gets me in trouble. The point is, I don't even recognize that guy. And the thing about you is like, I don't even recognize that person. But how beautiful it is when we just admit our mistake and, try to, and stop trying to blame everybody else for the mistake we made. It would be so beautiful. We could just be like, John. You drive a Prius. It's not fast. I know you're impatient today and you wanted to get somewhere and someone cut you off without a blinker, but that doesn't give you any, it, right, Sarah, come on, that doesn't give you any right <laughs> to say something you shouldn't or wave with the wrong finger. I don't do that, by the way. I'm just saying, I'm just trying to relate and have an example. You see what I'm saying? But it's, it's accountability. How beautiful it is if we just took responsibility and said, you know what, I did mess up and I can do better and the Lord wants me to do better and I'm going to keep marching. Stop letting the enemy steal your walk and your faith because you screwed up. And stop letting people that say they're Christian ruin your walk because you messed up and they were waiting. And they're casting their insecurities on you because they couldn't keep it together, so they're just going to look at you and, ah! Bugs me so much. I just want to karate chop the devil in the throat because I see so many of you hearing this stuff and getting discouraged. And it, it just drives us wild. As elders, we're like, dude, what? Get up. And keep running. You're not out of the race because you tripped. Keep going. Even if you found yourself wandering off, he's still saying, hey, come on back and go. Stop letting, and, and look at this. Love doesn't keep a record of wrong. So why are you keeping one on yourself? Come on. So this is talking about someone who calls themselves a brother. And, and man, this is so powerful. So he says, I'm, not, I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother. That's Christian. Hey, I'm a Christian. If he is guilty and continuing in these things, sexual immorality, greed, idolater, reviler, drunkard, swindler, not even to eat 
with that person. Does everyone understand what that is? It's saying someone who says they're a Christian, but yet everything about their way of life is not Christian. It's not because it's not graceful, it's because they now know better. If they say they know Jesus, we know better. And there's a difference between running your race and falling down versus completely going out of the race and being somewhere where we're like, what are you doing? And it provides a beautiful, wonderful accountability when someone comes up to me and they go, aren't you a Christian? Oh man, I wish all your secular friends would even be like, aren't you a Christian? <laughs> Look over there. <laughs> Amen? Come on. And then he says this at the end. He says, for what do I have to do with judging outsiders? Is it not inside the church whom we are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. Those are harsh words. Amen? Those are harsh. And when we look at it, we just have to, I'm just, don't hear what I'm not saying. And I know there needs to be a lot of clarity, but I'm not going to stay away from hard messages because there's a chance that you might take it wrong. I want to dive into awkward, and I want to lean in, and I want to say, listen, the friendships you put closest to you matter. They matter so much. And if you're belittling it, you need to have a check on your heart and say, man, the relationships closest to me are important. It's not saying that you get rid of all relationships. It's saying there's a level to people that I allow to speak into my life. That when I'm just in it, I call, and I'm like, man, thank you for your encouragement because I know where your heart is. Thank you for... You know what I mean? Like we all have to do that. That's why I love Be the Church. Do you know that there's churches going on right now that not even one person knows another person and they've been going there for 10 years? But the church is the people. It's the relationships. And if you don't have one person who's Christian, who's a friend, who's outside of this church, you're doing it wrong. Kingdom, not castles. Amen? Now listen to this letter. This is a spiritual father to a spiritual son who's a pastor. This is Paul speaking to Timothy. And it's 1 Timothy chapter 1, 18 through 20. Timothy, my son, here are my instructions for you based on the prophetic words spoken about you. May they help you to fight well in the Lord's battles. Cling to your faith in Jesus Christ and keep your conscience clear. Some people have deliberately violated their conscience. Who's he speaking to now? And as a result, their faith was shipwrecked. Do you know that you can have faith and then it becomes shipwrecked? Then Paul says, oh, by the way, here are their names. Oh, my gosh. How would you like when the first Bible came out and be like, are you Bahamanius? Are you Alexander? Are you the, are you the guy? Are you the, because I'm not going to even eat with you. <laughs> but you see what I mean? Like he goes in, look at that scripture, 1 Timothy 8. 1 Timothy 1, 18-20, Hymenaeus and Alexander are two of those examples. I threw them out, and I handed them over to Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. Now, if you've never been to church, no, I take it back. You've probably been to church, and you've probably never heard that. How many of you guys have heard that? Seriously, let's be honest, in a sermon. One, two, three, into the full. See, there, <laughs> sorry, it's just a thought. Not very many people hear this because it's a very hard concept. This is Paul saying, in the church, I literally handed these people over to Satan, the ruler of this world, so that they would learn. I really believe Paul's heart here is saying, I did this so that they would learn. It didn't say, I did this to be like, you suck, ah, look at them, ah. He did it out of a father's heart. He said, I did this so they would, they would learn not to blaspheme God. We are so like watered down that people blaspheme God and you don't even think about it. They blaspheme God and they blaspheme the God of the Christian. They blaspheme him over and over and over. They do it on cartoons. They do it on ads and we just think nothing of it. When Paul said in the church, he's like, I handed these guys over so that they would learn not to blaspheme God. There is a call, my friends, to pursue righteousness, not out of legalism, but out of love for God. Amen? Everyone's going to walk out of here. My feet hurt, including me. Now look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, 6 and 7. Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away or avoid from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition you receive from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us because we were not idle when we were with you. 
It just keeps getting better. This is tough, guys. This is tough scripture. These are tough words from a father who said, listen, what are we doing with our life? Idol? We know what idle hands do? It's almost like, have you ever, how many have ever been in a group assignment at school? And you already knew who the lazy people were. You said, please no whammies, please no whammies. John, here, you get Karen and Craig. Oh, no, they're lazy. Everyone knows that they're idle. And you got to do all the work in the project. Anyone in? But for him to go as far and saying, hey, if someone calls himself a brother and they're living in this, don't even eat with them. And then he says, if anyone calls themselves brother and they're walking in an idleness, not to be in accord with that person, like to avoid them. I've often asked this question that I don't have the answer to. When you meet a friend, do you go, you, like, I guess kids do this. Has your kid ever been like, my mom said I'm not allowed to be your friend because you watch demonic television. Have a good day. <laughs> my mom said I can't be your friend. You watch Care Bears, and that's witchcraft. <laughs> Paw Patrol, Power Rangers, oh, good Lord. Have you ever had that? Have you ever had to go to a friend and go, my mom says we're not allowed to be friends due to the last three arrests. She said that we got to stop hanging out. Don't act like you as a parent don't have that one friend that you're like, where are you going today? Oh, let me make up an excuse. Hey, we're doing a family day. <laughs> Dude, am I the only one? Come on. Even your adult kids are going, please, Lord, break that relationship in the name of Jesus. Oh, let that car run out of gas, Lord. Let that engine stop. Let the tires be stolen, Lord Jesus. I, come on. Come on. Be real. The older my kids get, the more I seem to be praying that way. Lord, would you just make a way? Send a solicitor to their house, Lord, and don't let him take no for an answer, Lord. Send the people that will knock on the door to just talk to them, Lord. Just help do something. Mm-hmm. We do it, don't we? Because bad company corrupts good morals. Who you hang out with will affect you. You're not exempt. I will even be vulnerable to say this. In 2009, I moved here with nothing. I was like, Texas, Lord, okay, well, what is there besides Walker, Texas? I had no idea what I was jumping into. I moved to Texas with absolutely nothing. I came with a, with a guy who was a mentor of mine who actually got offended at the church and then left the church, and then I was the next man up. It was like, hey, want to be the youth pastor? <laughs> what? I became the youth pastor. And I was like, I don't even know what I'm doing. But I grew close to God in that season, you guys. I grew close to God. I grew close to the people of God. And I will say this, for my example of living up in the Northwest, there's a reason why this is called the Bible Belt. Why? Because so many of y'all know the Bible. So many of y'all go to church. In the Northwest, they're like, well, Jesus, what? It's, very, it's more spiritually dry. Does that make sense to people? It's more spiritually dry. So I remember when I moved away, and I'll be vulnerable. I moved away, and I just felt my example slipping. I wasn't going to church. I didn't have my friends like Dr. Ledbetter and several of you in here that were my friends before I left. So I found myself in a place with no Christian friends and counsel. I was working at a restaurant, and I just found my character slipping. Have you guys ever been in a new group and you felt your character slipping? To where even you say, I became a new creation, and I don't even recognize what I'm doing right now. Who is this? if you're being honest with yourself. So I literally found myself doing things that I would never do. And guess who was there? All the people that are like, you're on candid camera. You said you were a youth pastor in Texas. And here you are, sucker. It was like they caught me while I was down, trying to just try to destroy my faith. But God just in his grace and mercy was just like, John, get up and keep following me. Because there's, there's, there's something with that. If you skip church every week, and you wonder why you find yourself slipping, it's because you're not taking the, the, the necessary time to build Christian relationships and to get edified and get encouraged and to get all of your counsel coming from the word of God instead of the world of others. Like, you know what I mean? You have, we have enough of the world out there. Facebook, all that kind of stuff. All right, let's keep going. Second Thessalonians. Oh, no, we already did that. So 
One was a brother that does all that nonsense. One is the idol. Look at 2 Thessalonians, so same chapter, chapter 3, verse 14 and 15. If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take a note of that person and have nothing to do with them, that he may be ashamed. Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. You're like, man, that's tough. It's tough. If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person, have nothing to do with them, that they may be ashamed. But here's the thing. It's the same learning principle that Paul had. May they learn not to blaspheme God. I really believe this, that there can be something that can be healthy that can lead to repentance and godliness. There is a revelation that happens. If there's something here, there's almost like that, like a healthy version of being ashamed that leads you to repentance to Jesus, that would lead you to say, like, man, I was wrong, I need Jesus. So here it's saying, have nothing to do with them that made me be ashamed. It's just like I said with Donnie. If I'm doing something and living a certain way and Donnie doesn't want to be hanging out with me, I got to go, Lord, what's wrong with me? Even David prayed the prayer, Lord, what is, search, search me, O Lord. And if there's anything in me that's the wrong way, may it get pointed out, plucked out, so that I can be closer to you. And I would think that that's all of our prayer and all of our heart in this room. Amen? Okay, so now, but look at that second part. Do not regard him as an enemy. Something happened. So when I gave my life to the Lord, it was 2008. You there with a good memory. 2008? 2008. 2008, I said, Jesus, not my way, but your way. Not my will, but your will. I want to be in the Lord's army. I want to just, I want to be close to you. And I remember I had a dance crew. We were all in the whole sex, drugs, alcohol thing. And I remember when I went to them and I was like, they're like, dude, I wanted to go out into the club and drink more than anybody else. So when I finally said like, dude, I don't want to go today. It was like the record stopped. You're, what? I was like, dude, I, like, I don't want to go. And it was just so crazy to them. And I'm like, man, I think I'm just going to kick it in my room. Just hang out. They were so baffled, but I'll tell you this. Following the Lord was the greatest decision I ever made, and guess what? Because I said, Lord, I want to separate myself to you, not from them, it was really hard. To, this process was very hard. Half of them came to Jesus Christ. Half of that dance crew said G yes to Jesus and dropped those old habits and old ways and became new creations in Christ. Half of them. Amen? Half of them. Keep going. First Corinthians no, sorry. Second, nope, did that one either. Titus chapter 3. <laughs> Titus chapter 3, 8 through 11. The saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. Here's some wisdom for all, all of us. Avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. I will tell you in this church, there's a difference between a healthy argument and an unhealthy argument. I don't, I don't mind two of you that have opposing views on, uh, on some point of scripture that you argue it out. How many guys have had kids and you go, wait, they'll figure it out, just hold on. I remember actually when the boys were fighting, I stopped Sarah, I'm like, just wait. Watch, they'll figure it out. And thank God they did, right? In this church, there's been arguments. I'm like, just wait, they'll figure it out. Because a healthy argument. When it gets unhealthy, that's when you got to jump in. But there's healthy arguments. So this is saying avoid those foolish ones. Those are ones that are unhealthy because they're unprofitable and worthless. As for a person, listen to this. As for a person who stirs up division, after warning him once, and warning him twice, have nothing more to do with him. Knowing that such a person is warped and sinful and he is self-condemned. Half of these scriptures, people would be like, that's not in the Bible. Because everyone's a Christian until you hear some hard stuff. <laughs> so the fact that he's like, hey, my will is that none should perish. But how serious he takes it when people blaspheme him. How serious he takes it where he would say his one children, he's like, that is not acting like my child. You don't associate with them, and you hope it leads to a repentance within his heart. Amen? 
Now, I just want to quickly go through the Proverbs. This is all on friendship. Check this out. A man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Amen and amen? Whoever loves discipline loves, loves knowledge. He who hates correction is? The word is stupid. Don't get mad at me. This is not, this is not my Bible. This is his Bible. This is his word. Proverbs thirteen twenty. Whoever walks with the wise will become wise. The companion of fools will suffer harm. How many times when we say, are you hanging out with that friend? And almost 100 out of 100 times, it led to something crazy. I remember a specific friend that every time I told my mom, I'm going to hang out with so-and-so, either I was brought home by the cops or someone posted on MySpace something crazy I did. Because it's true. The scripture's true. How many, look, and this is crazy too. Do you know that if I go play golf with people that are good at golf, I get better at golf. When I go play, play with people who suck at golf, guess what happens to me? I turn into a three-year-old. I can't hit the ball. When I hang out with Cecil in the group that's weightlifting, I remember when I pushed the sled that had more weight than I thought was possible. I was actually trying to make excuses of why I needed to go home because they were doing the heavy weight, and I went. And then I was like, I'm just going to try it and see if I could do it. And I did it. And it was just like, it's just like the same thing. When I get around people that are doing something, I do it. That's why the Bible says, be careful of making your friends all idle people who are doing nothing. Because when I get with certain people that are doing certain things, I find myself doing those things. Amen? You get what I'm saying? So I want to find people that are on fire, that love Jesus, that are creative, that want to create content to change the world for the Christ. That's who I want to surround myself with. And that's who I try to surround myself with. Let's look at another one. Proverbs 16, 28. A dishonest man will spread strife. Whisper, a whisper can separate close friends. Proverbs 22, 5 and 6. Listen to this. Make no friendship with a man given over to anger, nor a wrathful man, lest you learn his ways and entangle yourself in a snare. Proverbs 27, 5. Better is an open rebuke than hidden love. That's if Samuel does something stupid. I go, Samuel, that was stupid. Love you. Does everyone understand that? We are so soft as a society, we can't even handle open rebuke because we're like, that hurt my feelings because we're watered down with a society that says love is never correcting anybody. This is probably the biggest frustration as a pastor or an elder is when rebuke time comes and it's like, you said you love me, man. <laughs> the fact that you would look at my Facebook and correct me for, for, for snorting coke and doing those things is very hurtful to my feelings. I'm going to go in my safe space for two hours. You see what I'm saying? It's crazy. Accept the correction and move on. I'm tired of babying. Like, we baby babies because they need it. You don't baby people that Paul's like, dude, you should be a Christian adult by now. Come on. Mama. Okay, anyway, let's keep going. <laughs> Proverbs 27, 17. Iron sharpens iron as a friend sharpens a friend. I love getting around our elder team. Every single time we do our calls or anything else, guess what? I'm being sharpened. I'm seeing a brother go through a hard situation, and I'm watching how he does it, and I'm like, that's what I'm going to do if I go in that situation. You can't help but sharpen each other. If you're not being sharpened, it's probably because you're not being honest of what you're really dealing with. If you're struggling with porn, lust, depression, dude, what do you think we're all here for? Edification, pointing you to Christ. You can't get healed if you're trying to hide everything. If I'm trying to turn the light switch on, but you keep walking away and pulling the light switch from me, I don't want you to see what's going on here. Then how are we ever going to heal from it? I'd rather have this church full of people that come who they are and leave forever changed because of Jesus' power and his word and his Holy Spirit. Amen? All right, cool. keep looking at this. And trust me, as my kids grow up, I'm going to be reading this all the time. All these scriptures about wisdom and who you surround yourself with. And how beautiful it is it when your kids even recognize, Mom, I've decided after three hangouts with this person that I'm tired of getting in trouble. And Lila said, Amen and Amen. Lila, I'm specifically talking to you. <laughs> Pastor's kids, right? they got to use them in the sermons. But it's important. Her making her friends and choosing her friends is really important to me. And I'm so proud when she chooses a friend that loves God. I'm like, go on, girl. Change the world. Come on. It's awesome. All right, 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts what? Good morals. 
The, look at, look at uh, what David said in Psalms. I do not sit with men of falsehood or a bunch of liars. I do not consort with hypocrites. I hate the assembly of evildoers, and I will not sit with the wicked. Listen again in Psalm chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and he meditates it on day and night. And this is lastly what I'm going to end with as the worship team comes up and is found in John chapter 15, verse 12 through 17. Who you make your friend is, one of, is, the, is the third most important decision, unless you don't get married and you stay single, it's the second most important decision. Amen? Who you surround yourself. Who becomes your John? Who is your Peter, James, and John? Who are you surrounding yourself with? Could it be that you're not getting rid of certain friends because you're still struggling with the sin that they're bringing to your life that you're not ready to let go? Come on, I know I'm preaching to somebody. Because you haven't sacrificed that secret sin and your friend gets in that secret sin, you're like, well, I'll keep him as a friend because maybe you're not ready to let go of the sin. Don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying to be some stuck-up person that doesn't love people. God has a heart for broken people to see them restored. But there's a clear line when you choose God to start behaving like you chose God. There's a point in time where you said, I'm going to be a light in Christ. I'm going to choose that. Amen? So you have to choose it. So listen to John chapter 15. This is talking about the true vine. Pay attention. Look at me. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends. This is Jesus, the Savior of the universe, talking to us. You are my friends if you do what I command you to do. No longer I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you my friends, for all that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you that you should go and you should bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. So with that ever that you ask in the name of my Father, he will give to you. These things I command to you so that you will love one another. Jesus calls you his friend. If you're sitting here and you're saying, I have not made Jesus my friend. If I have not chosen him to be my source of my pick-me-up, my source of help in time of need, my source of joy when I'm depressed, my source of encouragement and motivation when I'm feeling lazy, my source of just who I go to. If Jesus has become the acquaintance or something, like today, that's the altar call. If you're watching online, salvation, you make Jesus Lord, you make Jesus friend. You make Jesus all of those things. And I would encourage you this. Most of you, I know you, you came to church because you're already a believer. You already love Jesus Christ with all your heart. A lot of you in here have said, Jesus is number one. But I want to encourage you to look at these scriptures. I want to encourage you to look at your own life and say, who are my bestest friends? Who are the people that speak into my life? And, you, and, and the other thing that creeps in is people go, oh, I don't know that person. I blew my kid's mind when I said, do you know that everyone you know now you didn't know at one point? <laughs> like you just shrunk back like Keanu Reeves into the ultimate universe. He was just like, what? I said, yeah, everyone you know now you did not know at one point. If you don't have the friends in your life, the, you know what the Bible says? If you want a friend, it says be a friend. So many of you are looking for friends in the wrong places. So many of you are looking for a friend who will tell you what you want to hear rather than what you need to hear. Jesus is the friend that tells you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear because your fresh flesh craves this and craves that. He's one who will rebuke you openly and lovingly. He is one that not only that, but sent you his Holy Spirit to help you be a better witness for him. He's the ultimate friend. If you're watching online or you're watching in two years, like if you want to make Jesus Christ Lord, you want to make God the Father, you want to say, I want a friend in Jesus, then you can have that today. The rest of you, I just challenge you, simply look at the closest relationships you have in your life. And some of, the, some of you, a lot of you, the Holy Spirit's already told you the relationships that you need to kind of cut off or the relationships that you say, I need to avoid this relationship for a little while. Even in my phone, you guys, I go through my phone all the time and I say, Lord, 
Am I released from this person? Lord, do I need to change this relationship? See, and I use this illustration. How many of you guys remember MySpace? If you're a kid, you're like, what in the world is MySpace? Before Facebook, before Twitter, and before Instagram came MySpace. MySpace did it right. Here's what they did. They gave you a little box on your MySpace, and it says, tell the world who are your eight closest friends. I know some of you kids are like, that's a great idea. Why doesn't Facebook do that? So on my MySpace, it says, these are my top eight friends. Look at them. I'm proud. But then something happens. Well, why did Greg get replaced with Don? What happened? <laughs> you would tell the world. I publicly say, this is not my best friend. <laughs> I have this best friend. Then MySpace said, man, people are getting crazy. Let's make it a top 32. Then they did top 64. Then MySpace went under. <laughs> but I think there's power to that. Because the people who are your closest friends is what you're going to look like. Because that's who's influencing your daily decisions. And listen, some of you are, are trying to make, and it has to be a mutual thing. And I believe God will instruct this. Because there's people that you're discipling, there's people that you're getting discipled by, and then there's like the friendships. And God has friendships for you. I will tell you that he sends them sometimes in seasons. I will tell you publicly, I've never had like a best friend. Like some people have the best friend that they're like, this is my bestie, and they're like best friends. I've never had that for like longevity. I've had seasons of amazing relationships. And I will tell you to stop waiting Stop waiting. Some of you are going to move. Some of you are going to get different jobs. Some of you, your season's going to change and you're not going to be around as much. Take advantage of the friendships that God has put in your life right now. Stop letting the enemy go, well, if you leave, then why make a friend? Are you kidding me? That's, that's, not, that's probably not God. Good friends will help you reach your goal even at the cost of time with them. Even if it costs me time away from you, even as a pastor, when I say, man, I love Chris, but I know Chris is called to pastor a church somewhere that's not in Texas because he hates the heat and God is a good God. So even though I love Chris, I know he's called. And I want to make sure that our friendships are not covered in selfishness, but they're truly covered in how can I be the best friend to equip and to train the people around me so that they can go be all that God created them to be healthier friendships. Would you please stand all over this place? Not bad. It's only 12, 15. Some of you, I even heard your stomach growling from the stage. Get friends. Make friends. Do you know that everything we do is for the kingdom? We have three local churches represented on Man Mondays because it's about the kingdom. It's not about covenant life. It's about the kingdom. You need friends in your life that are go to other churches. We need relationships with more Christians because that is how we're going to make a bigger difference. Amen? So, I would love nothing more than people making friends in here. I love when some of you come in here and be the church happens and God kind of pushes you out of your comfort zone and you go, I'm going to go make a friend. And sometimes they happen in the most unlikely places. There's been some people in here that I would never think that I'd be close friends with and we're like, we're like one marriage away from bunk beds. Like if we weren't married, we'd probably be bunk beds. Like I've made such great friendships in this place. And I want to tell you, stop letting the enemy rob you of good friendship. The enemy is telling you to hide things from your friends, and it's not healthy. The enemy has tried to convince you that you shouldn't correct your friend or rebuke your friend or lovingly share with your friend, and that's wrong. An open rebuke is better than kisses of an enemy. I don't want to be flattered. I want to be loved. And part of love is correction. And if the church of God can get that right, come on, we'd be better. Who wants to walk around in error? None of us. We all want to walk around corrected. So I'm preaching next week too, so I'll save some of it for next week. So I am going to ask our elders to be up front and some of our prayer team. If you have never made Jesus the Lord of your life, today's your day. It's the most important decision you'll ever make in your life. Some of you have wandered away and you need to wander back. Well, maybe it's not wandering back. You need to be brought back. Grab on to a friend who will be lovingly discipling you that will speak the truth when you're wandering away and bring you back. So if you've been wandering away, today's your day. Come back and get on the path. Some of you, you tripped, and your friend said, look at you, you're drunk, look at you. You said you're a Christian, look at you, you're cussing. Look at you, you're doing this. Look at you, you're treating your kids bad. Some of you have let the enemy take away your faith and your walk. 
get up, stop being condemned and shamed. Jesus would just say, get up and sin no more. Keep going. If that's you, come up to the front, get some prayer. Amen and amen. So Father God, thank you, Jesus. I love you. We love you. I thank you for your correction. I thank you for your discipline. I thank you for your rebuke. I thank you for friendships. Lord, I thank you for the model. You had John, a disciple who you loved. You had Peter, James, and John. You had your 12 disciples. You, you went out and you guys teamed up and you made a difference in the world. May we do that today, God. May some of these friendships, even in this room, go on to change society. Lord, I think about Ben and Scott. They were enemies. Now they are friends changing the world for Jesus Christ. Friendships like that, may they continue in this place and in this house. And Lord, give us the boldness to put boundaries in place with friendships that we know need to be taken down another level. People that need to go from top eight to top whatever. Help us have the boldness and discernment and to be loving as we build these relationships and connections. In Jesus' name, amen.
give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. For great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour So we pour out our praise to you only. Great are you, Lord. Come on, sing. You give life. You give life. You are love. You bring life to the darkness. You give hope. You restore. Every heart that is broken, great are you, Lord. It's your breath, it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we Sing it out. Shout your 
your breath it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour Saying to the Father this morning. For great are you, Lord. Come on, just sing that over and over again. For great are you, Lord. And why is he so great? Because it's this. It's breath. Come on, sing. So we pour out our praise. We pour we pour it out to yeah, yeah. So we pour out our praise. Come on. It's your breath. It's your breath. And I love. So we pour it out. We pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath. Come on, we pour it out. So we pour out. to the majesty and greatness. It's the only thing we can say, right? Is how great you are. But the transformation of his breath and out of that, the power, the power to say those things and believe. You know, I was just, I had a glimpse just thinking about Revelation and the heralds of holy, holy, holy right now happening in heaven. And we get to just have a little contribution from this little place, but yet it's going into eternity. When you declare his glory, when you declare his praise, and it's out of that deep, deepness of who we are. Wow. Thank you, guys. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for our online guests. Um, you know, this team, I know they, they're not going to stop. You guys hang around because... The Lord has showed up through his word, through the
the worship through the prayer and intercession. So, Father God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for this time. Thank you that we've got some truth that we have to go deal with, Father God, that was shared with us today through your Holy Scriptures. So, Father God, we love you. We honor you. We bless your holy name. In your name we pray. Amen. Sure.